Hi, my name is Natalie and I'm a medievalist, but today we're going to be talking about the history of the police in the United States of America. As with all of my history videos, this is purely factual and my sources will be listed down below. I'm sure you've heard a lot of people asking you to educate yourself lately, and that's exactly what I'm here to help you do. So let's get started. Due to the nature of the formation of the United States, early policing in the US started by following a structure really similar to that of England. In the early colonies, policing took two forms. It was both informal and communal, which was referred to as the watch, and private for-profit policing, which was referred to as the big stick. The watch system was composed mostly of volunteers whose duty was to warn of impending danger. The first night watch was created in Boston in 1636, the next in New York in 1658, and the next in Philadelphia in 1700. The night watch was actually largely ineffective at doing their job as watchmen were often drunk or asleep rather than actually doing their job. And as the watch was theoretically supposed to be voluntary, which would lead to people who actually cared about the job being on the job, many volunteers were actually just there to evade military service, or they were conscripted by their town, or they were performing their watch duties as a form of punishment, meaning they were criminals. Philadelphia instituted the first day watch in 1833 and New York in 1844. Augmenting the watch system was a system of constables. These were actual law enforcement officers and they were paid using the fee system that was attached to the warrants that they served. And in many cities, the constables were also responsible for supervising the night watches, but that was really not a highly sought after job. When localities started to try to impose conscripted service, people who were rich enough would end up paying someone else to take their conscription, which led to more, usually criminals or lazy people who didn't really care about the job, ending up being constables. As the nation grew, however, different regions made use of different policing systems. In cities, increasing urbanization led the night watch system to become completely useless as communities just got too big. And so the first publicly funded full-time police force was created in Boston in 1838, almost 200 years after the first night watch was created there. Boston was a large commercial shipping center and businesses had been hiring people to safeguard the transport of their goods from the port of Boston to other places. But this surmounted large costs for the private sector. So these merchants came up with a way to keep their goods protected while also saving money. They transferred the cost of maintaining a police force to the citizens by claiming that it was for the collective good. In actuality, it really just served rich merchants and their business partners by making sure that the poor would pay for their expenses so they could keep getting richer and the poor could keep getting poorer. Nevertheless, by 1800, all major US cities had a municipal police force for this purpose. These modern police forces shared similar characteristics. Here are four of them. One, they were publicly supported and bureaucratic in form. Two, police were full-time employees and not volunteers or independent contractors. Three, departments had fixed rules and procedures and employment as a police officer was continuous. And four, all of these police departments were accountable to a central government authority. However, in the South, the economics that drove the creation of police forces weren't motivated by shipping interests, but by the preservation of the slave system. Some of the primary policing institutions there were tasked not with protecting Some of the primary police institutions there were slave patrols, tasked with chasing down runaway slaves and with preventing and responding to slave revolts. The first formal slave patrol was created in Carolina in 1704. During the Civil War, the primary form of law enforcement in the South was the military, but during Reconstruction, many sheriffs performed in a way that was analogous to slave patrols. They enforced segregation and the disenfranchisement of freedmen. Slave patrols had three primary functions. One, to chase down, apprehend, and return to their owners, runaway slaves. Two, to provide a form of organized terror to deter slave revolts. And three, to maintain a form of discipline for any slave workers outside of the law if they violated plantation rules. Following the Civil War, these vigilante-style organizations evolved into modern police departments. 
primarily as a means of controlling freed slaves who were now laborers in an agricultural caste system and to enforce Jim Crow segregation laws designed to deny equal rights to freed men and their access to the political system. Similar to how these vigilante slave patrols evolve into the modern police system, Jim Crow laws evolve into the prison industrial complex, but that's a whole video of its own. More than crime, these modern United States police forces played the role of protecting the rich and their goods so that trade and the economy would continue to run smoothly and to maintain social and public order. What constitutes social and public order depends largely on who you're asking. And in the cities of 19th century America, they were defined by mercantile interests. The emerging commercial elites needed a mechanism to ensure a stable and orderly workforce for their conduct of business. And as we said, these mercantile interests also meant they wanted to divest themselves of their own cost of protecting their businesses by transferring those costs from the private sector to the state. In fact, since 1855, the Supreme Court has consistently ruled that the police have no obligation to protect any individual, despite their motto, protect and serve. Their duty is to enforce the law in general. The first such Supreme Court case was in 1855 and the most recent in 2005 in which such case, Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, the Supreme Court ruled, the Supreme Court ruled that a town and its police department could not be sued for failing to enforce a restraining order, which had led to the murder of a woman's three children by her estranged husband. However, there are federal law enforcement agencies whose mission includes protecting individuals usually high-ranking executives such as the president and accompanying family members, visiting foreign dignitaries, and other high-ranking officials. Such agencies include the U.S. Secret Service and the U.S. Park Police. In the early 19th century, large numbers of immigrants from Germany and Ireland began settling in the large urban areas of New York City. Indeed, the existence of large immigrant populations in the growing cities of the East was perceived as a threat to the very fabric of American society. Sound familiar? By the 1960s, massive political and social change began erupting all over the United States as the civil rights movement began challenging racist policies all over the country. The use of police forces to suppress the civil rights movement, often by brute force, did irreparable damage to the already tainted reputation of American policing. From 1964 to 1968, riots, usually sparked by police brutality or oppression, rocked the major cities in the United States. Police mishandling of large demonstrations against the Vietnam War in the late 1960s and early 1970s was also incredibly controversial. All of this political instability was further antagonized by a series of political assassinations. President John Kennedy in 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and Senator Robert Kennedy in 1968, and Governor George Wallace in 1972. Other political leaders, mostly in the Black community, were also assassinated or murdered, such as Malcolm X. National commissions created to investigate riots and political tensions frequently and universally pointed to the police as a source of social tension. The police and criminal justice system's response to the civil rights movement was twofold. Large sums of federal money were made available for rather cosmetic police community relations programs. These were mostly media-focused attempts to improve police image. By the 1980s, many police departments began to think of a new solution, community policing. Community policing is the latest iteration in efforts to improve relations between the police and the community, decentralize the police, and three, in response to the overwhelming body of scholarly literature, which claims that police have no impact on crime, no matter their emphasis or role. Such literature includes an LA Times article published in 2017, which reports that when the NYPD took a break from proactive policing in an attempt to show the community how much they were needed, actually major crime reports decreased. To recap, from the beginning, the American police force, which was indeed preceded by slave patrols and ragtag volunteer night watches, has been largely tied not to crime, but to the maintenance of the status quo and the American political economy, as well as the racist Anglo-Saxon ideals of American culture. The police are under no obligation to serve or protect the people. By law, they do serve the greater good, meaning the American economy, which is divulged into whatever keeps the rich getting richer, no matter the repercussions for the middle and lower working classes. 
who are of course disproportionately Black and Latino due to the lasting effects of segregation and racist policies that have been historically upheld by the police. Thank you for watching today. I hope you'll take a moment to share this video with someone who needs to see it. If you are able, please click the link below to donate to Boston University's student government ex-Black Student Union fundraiser.